When Gary Trousdale was growing up in the wilds of La Crescenta, California, he wanted to be an architect, but his non-enthusiasm for math eventually led him in a new direction. I was in high school, he says, and a student from CalArts came to our career day. I signed up for her seminar and soon realized that animation was a field that I could get into. After a year at community college, Gary transferred to CalArts, where he spent the next three years learning the basics of the craft and making student films. The early 80s was not a boom time for the cartoon industry, but Gary managed to get hired by a small studio in the valley that soon, sadly, went out of business. There was the usual scramble to find new work, and after a stint as an illustrator, Disney Feature Animation called and offered Mr. Trousdale a job as an effects in-betweener on the Black Cauldron. And that Disney gig that was supposed to last only six months continued for two decades. From the effects department, Gary moved into story, and from story, on to direction. Mr. Trousdale's first directing assignment was on the iconic Beauty and the Beast, followed by The Hunchback of Notre Dame and Atlantis. Each of those pictures presented its own unique challenges. Today, Gary is a director at DreamWorks Animation, where he's worked for nearly a decade. We talked in the conference room of the Animation Guild. So here we are on October 11, 2012, and we're talking to Gary Trousdale about the story of his life, but specifically about the wonderful world of your professional career. Um, and you were with a big crop of people at Cal Arts all who found their way into the business and prospered. Uh, how did you find your way to Cal Arts, and then how did you find your way out? And you told me earlier that you didn't go immediately to Disney like 87.2% of the others. Right. So we'll talk about that. But how did you come to go to Cal Arts in the first place? Um, when I was in high school, I wanted to uh, I wanted to be an architect, and that was you know I, I was taking at the time digital technology had not taken over uh, drafting or mechanical drawing yet so it was it was something where I could draw and you know have a fair amount of precision and yeah. creativity etc uh, the problem with it is that there's an amount of engineering that goes with it which is dependent on math and I sucked, sucked at math sucked at you math. and me both uh, failed, and I passed it on to my children failed miserably at math um, so Around mid senior year, uh, you know, when when it was clear that my you know, my architecture dream of architecture was crashing and burning, um, they had at uh, and I went to school fairly locally up in uh, Crescenta Valley, uh, oh, Crescenta. Oh, Crescenta Valley High School. CVHS, yeah. Crescenta Valley, nineteen sixty seven. Ah, seventy eight. Um, so they had at that time, it was like a. From time to time, they'd have like a career day kind of thing, and this year, I, th I think it was '77 at the time. It was um, it was like a career week, and they set aside like like four days out of the week where they would have professionals from basically every walk of life come in, and like all oh, classes yeah, yeah. were suspended. And you would pick like, okay, I want to I want to go to the two hour, two hour lecture by the fireman. Or the or the insurance executive or the you know the whatever, and or the cartoonist. There was a girl from Cal Arts there that was teaching animation, and I thought. And up to this point, I you know animation was not really something I had considered because it was in my mind in 1977, animation was done by elderly gentlemen in sweater vests. And, right, right, you know, that, right. That was. That was what you did. Were you into the doing the funny cartoons and all I that stuff? I was doing like flip books, and I, I, I did um, you know like like single panel cartoons and things like that. But um, I I wasn't making my own films. I, I had done like a, a couple stop action films a few years before, but um, um, this this girl from Cal Arts from Jules Engel's class. The uh, and she the, was a student. She was a student. She was she okay. she was like you know like an upperclassman. I don't know how many years she'd been there, and I. I Sorry, I don't even remember her name, but she had come in from Jules Engel's program, the experimental animation, and we set up, you know, like 15 people in a, in an art class room, and uh, 
gave us blank film leader and sharpies and did flip books and did stop action. So she did this with you guys yeah. when you were. Oh yeah. wow! And it was like a two day thing, you know, because because she had people like like doing, uh, you know, like the, the the blank the blank leader animation, and then she took it off and shot it, and then came back like the next day and showed it. And you. showed it, you know, just, there's like two minutes of film that, that everybody wow. in the class had contributed to. Wow! It. So that was a kick and. And not many people were, you know, were interested. For most people, like most high school art classes, it was like a dodge to get out of, you know, the work. And <laughs> That's right. For, for me, it was it was like, okay, where is this Cal Arts place? This is, you know, it, suddenly this door was opened. Like, you can really do this and make a living at it. And and this is where you learn how to do it. Because at that time, there were not that many animation programs in other schools. I mean, yeah. I think oh, Ringling yeah. had started, and I think uh, Sheridan was was oh, up yeah. and running but not much else no and they were they were very embryonic yeah now there's tons of them even there. cal arts had only been around like 10 years less than 10 years at that time they'd been around six years at that time because right. they opened in 71 yeah and i think i think the uh, animation program had been a lot shorter term than that right because they didn't even have that going initially right so yeah. it was it was jack okay. hannah and bob mccray were the ones that were uh heading up the uh, the animation program yeah that. so i thought okay this is what i want to do Rather than you know go there straight out of high school, I had never, I had never really been a, an, an artist, you know. So I didn't have a portfolio. I honestly didn't even know what a portfolio was. So <laughs> I had a, a buddy of mine, whose mom was a painter. She was like a landscape painter, and she was like the closest thing to like a, a established professional artist that I knew. And I went to her and said, "What is a portfolio? What do you do? How do you make it?" You know. So she helped me like just through the concept, and you, know, you get all your artwork, and you do this, and you do that. And, so I thought, well, I don't have that much stuff. So I spent a year at Glendale Community College right, taking right, right. art classes. Took art history, took watercolor, took uh, oil painting, took life drawing. I mean, just anything I could think of. And, you know, and a couple academic classes that I ultimately dropped out of because it was like, this is not really what I want to do. So right, I, right, right. So I just built up, you know, this body of work there put it in a portfolio and submitted it next year. So I got into uh, Cal Arts based on a little bit of, of like, you know, kind of cartoon doodle work that I had done in high school, but mostly like life drawing and painting and design work. Stuff that you did at community college. At college, yeah. So so that's that's how I found out about Cal Arts. That's how I that's how wow. I got into that. I had no idea that we went to the same high school. Yeah. Up until uh, you know I moment. think I remember hearing that like twenty years ago. But, really? Uh, maybe, yeah. Because I, yeah, I just, and the funny thing about La Crescenta and La Cunada is even then they were filled with Disney artists, as many as there were at yeah. the time. Yeah, They were sprinkled all over. There that's right, that's where uh, Frank and Ollie were in, in like yeah, La Cunada. They Lacanata. lived in La Cunada, yeah. Flint Ridge. And Clarence and Nash was down like out of, uh, my mom was his next door neighbor when she was a kid. So. Yeah, and there was just, just a lot. Josh Metter, who was yeah. a big effects guy, yeah. lived lived up um, a couple of blocks off Rosemont. Okay. So, oh uh, yeah, I mean, yeah. he was long gone by the time you... Right, you know. but I certainly know the name. But yeah, he lived, and my, my dad and he lived three blocks from one another. Right. And uh, Wilfred Cartwright. Jackson lived in Sunland Tahunga. Randy Cartwright was in uh, La Crescenta. Oh. I mean, there's all kinds of people up there. So, and... Uh, John Musker lives up there now. Yeah. So, you know, Andy Gaskell lives up there. All oh, I didn't know Andy people. lived up there. Yeah, he okay. lives in he lives in Flint Ridge. Okay. So, oh yeah, there's a there's a lot. It's just uh, it's amazing. But Crescent Valley High School. Yeah. So, okay, so, so we're up to 1978, and you so I got it. I got into truck colors. off to Valencia. Yeah, and spent um, spent three years in their animation program. And after every at, at the end of every year. Uh, they would have at that time it was called the Disney Show. Right now it's called the Producers Show because right. there's more, there's more studios. Right. But at there's that time, studios. Disney was basically the only studio that would that would come out and look at the students' work and hire directly from from the student body. Um, I mean, there were a couple other studios around. There was like Hanna Barbera was still around and Filmation was still around, and I think Ruby Spears was just kind of getting off the ground. But but um, it was it was basically it was Disney was the only game in town. Right. Oh, yeah. At um, that time. Yeah, at that time. And so the students would work like, you know, like they do now. They would work all year on their student film and then present it. 
and hopefully um, you would be picked on the strength of your student film to uh, you know either do an intern internship or to go and work at, uh, at the studio and at the end of every year it's like three or four people would get picked sometimes a little more sometimes one or two but at the end of every year so what happened at my junior year this is 1980 right? 1980 it's a uh, or 81 89, 89, 80, 80, 81 yeah yeah 81 I went there and you know got into the you know the 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 showing and the Disney people came and they pretty much said at the end of it, okay, well, you know, we're, we're just not hiring now. We've, we're full. <laughs> we're not hiring. We don't, have, we don't have any more spaces. And I think they took two people as interns. All the slots are filled. Yeah, basically. It's a, we're done. Um, they took two interns. I think they took Mike Show and Bob Seeley. And mm -hmm. so, so they went, uh, uh, they went for, the, for the summer internship knowing that they would be booted out again at, at the end of that. And I, I was like... Well, I hadn't planned on, you know, I had, or I kind of planned, but I was, hadn't hoped to spend another year at CalArts, but I might as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, back then, which, which is kind of a marked difference from now, if you had to spend all four years of the program in animation, you were really not that good an animator oh, because you, you, didn't get, you didn't get hired and out of school. Nobody swept you away. Nobody swept you away. I mean, so it was not the goal <laughs> to get a degree. It was a goal to get to a get job. Hired. Oh, yeah, yeah, to get hired. Oh, yeah. the funny thing is, is... Ten years later, it's when I took over this job, they were it, it, the industry was expanding like crazy. Oh and yeah, they were jumping. You if if you had been a few oh, years yeah. later, oh, it yeah. would have been. I mean, like everybody back, would have been gobbled up. Back when uh, you know, like like the post Lion King days, or or all the 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 the, the Simpson days. I mean, when when TV animation was really hot. You know, you, we got the Powerpuff Girls and. Uh, Samurai Jack, you know, all, all this other stuff out of Gendy. it. Gendy didn't go through CalArts. I think he did. did. Yeah, he did? I think he did, yeah. That's so um, what I know. So. So, um, so at, the end of, at the end of that year, I was like, okay, well, you know, I guess I better get my financial aid forms in, you know, in, in order and, and uh, so I'm gonna be back. figure out my housing for next year because we'd already gotten kicked out of our condominium, uh, you know, for that year and I'm going to be back. And walking through the hallway, there was a, a notice on one of the bulletin boards that said, new animation studio starting up, start on the ground floor, work with industry professionals. Okay, so me and a car full of my friends drove down to Studio City, and we met with Phil Mendez, who was working for a guy named Tom Carter, and um, you know presented our work, and I was hired on the spot. And wow. it was like... Hooray! I don't have <laughs> touchdown. <laughs> I, I, I don't have to live out of my car. That's right. Um, I don't have to find housing. Yeah. I don't have to. I was a squatter in the, in, the, in, the, in the school for a couple of weeks, like at the end there, like between between getting out of our getting kicked out of our apartment and and like moving back in with my parents. I was like, all right, well. And they're no, still no, up in La Crescenta, right? Yeah, yeah. My mom is. My dad passed away, but. Um, um, yeah, so so I got I got hired there, moved to North Hollywood, and worked for uh, worked for Phil Mendez for about a year until that studio went spectacularly out of business. And what were you working on? It was a little short. I mean, they he had a they had a bigger um, feature like kind of in the works. Right. Um, and it was it was called Huck's Landing, and it was basically this this kind of Huckleberry Finn and talking animal movie that he was going to tie into some casino property in Las Vegas, you know, to make like this kind of family friendly Las Vegas experience, sure. which at that time was like, that's crazy. You know, this is before, before they started, before doing they started it. doing that in a big way. It was so, still a mob. And then. Yeah. So, um, so that was one thing. And then, and then they wanted to do some shorts as well. So they had this, this, uh, like little bear cub, that uh, oh yeah yeah I remember that little bear called cub. Kissy Fur yeah yeah and so that's he had that property for a long time yeah 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 and so that's what we worked on and we worked on that for a while and then uh, and were you, were you doing character animation were I was, you doing I was doing storyboards I was doing yes all of the above um, you were doing and, everything and, and directing yeah I mean that was like my first kind of taste at directing 
Although it was mostly it was mostly like animation and and boarding and. Did every did anything get to the? Um, I've got a sample stage. If it never because it never got finished, right? Because the yeah. studio imploded. You know, I don't think it did. Um, I mean, I heard that there is a, a, a version floating around somewhere. I think I think Leo Sullivan has has like a, a copy of it somewhere. Yeah. But um, uh, Floyd Norman might, but I I don't, and I, yeah. I, I never saw it finished. Um, and so yeah, so that went out of business, and I, um, you know, suddenly found myself like having to pay rent in an apartment and, and uh, no money coming and in. no money coming in. So I got a job down in Santa Monica doing illustration for a company that did flyers for uh, bars and restaurants. So yeah, yeah. I worked there for a while. Still going out, you know, like on a, you know, every every two three weeks with my portfolio shopping it around. Like, okay, here's Kurtz and Friends. Try them. Here's Don Bluth. Try him. Here's you know just all the different studios yeah. around, and had papered the stairway with my rejection letters. Like, no, we don't need you at this time. No, you know, I, you know, I got turned down by Filmation because I didn't draw well enough. It's like, <laughs> God's sake. So <laughs> it was, you know, and I, of course, went to Disney as well. And Mark Dindle at the time was the head of effects on um, The Black Cauldron. And oh, yeah. He, and he said, because at that time I was, I wanted to be a character animator. And he said, well, you know, they're really going to be looking for uh, effects animators. You might want to kind of, kind of re, re, um, orient your your portfolio kind of gear it more towards effects sure. which i had never done but i thought well, i'll try it you know so i started doing reboot yeah so i so i started so i started trying that and i took my portfolio in and met with don han who was he was kind of a i don't know what was the his title back he was then. probably a production manager yeah. or a production assistant yeah. he was under i think he was working at that time under ed hansen yes exactly and uh he at the time, I think he was married to Ed's daughter. Yes. And he basically just sort of, I think he was sort of being groomed at that time to sort of be the next Ed when Ed retired out right. of there. Then uh, he would, uh, and I think Don Duckwall had just sort of exited because I think he took the, he took the fall for Don leaving with, Half of the crew. Oh, okay. Uh, during Fox and the Hound. That was I, like '78. That, that. Well, that happened. Yeah, it happened. '78, '79. Yeah, because I remember it's like right before I'm ready to, you know, like before I have any training or you know can can step in and maybe. Right, because you're just starting, so yeah. you need a little more season. Yeah. But yeah, and and Don, I think Ron Miller, sort of. Why didn't you stop this? Why didn't you see this coming? Why didn't you? And Don, I think. I never did remember exactly when he vanished, but yeah. he was like, you know, there's mumblings of, oh, he's in trouble. You know, that people are mad and one day gone, he was gone. gone. And then he was gone. Yeah. And he was close to retirement anyway. Right. And so I think the thing was, they just retired him out of there. They said, you're retiring a year early. Right. And maybe I'm wrong, maybe he just retired, but it seemed to me that he was sort of under the gun for letting this horrible thing happen, right. half the staff exit. So. Well, so I, I, I presented it to Don Hahn, the, my portfolio. Yeah, yeah. And he looked at it and said, all right, yeah, this is good. You know, well, we don't have anything at this time, yeah, but we'll give you a call when we do. Which is exactly what all the other studios say. Right. You know, which we don't it, have anything at this time. Translation is no. So <laughs> That's I was like, right. All right, whatever. So I went back to work down at Grand American Fair, you know, doing, doing my uh, flyers and, and illustration and you know, calligraphy, which was all done by hand. Back when Paste Up was using real paste. And um, <laughs> we had a big photostat machine, and you know. Oh yeah. Very, 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 very primitive. Um, but you know, it was it was work, and it was it was enjoyable work, and I was having a good time, and it wasn't at a lot of money, but it was a nice company, you know, and they took care sure. of people. So, um, so I was down there, and I was there about nine months, and I got a phone call one day, like at work. Um, this is pre cell phone days, also. So they, he had my number there. Like, had, had to go to the company phones. Yeah, the wall it's like phone. hello. Yeah, uh, yeah. This is Don Hahn from Disney. Um, you know, we we, uh, we we spoke some months ago. I was wondering if you were still interested in that job at Disney. Can you start? So this is like two or three months later. This is like nine months later. Nine months later. Yeah. So you were down there for better part of a year or yeah. a year. Yeah. And uh, and uh, so we're, can can you start this week? <laughs> it's crunch time. I said. Um, 
I would love to start this week. I am interested, but I have to at least give two weeks notice. You know, so he said, okay, I understand. Great. Click. I'm leaving. Yeah, right. <laughs> and so, you know, it was like, congratulations. Start, sorry to see you go. Um, you asshole. What are you doing this to us for? So, right. you're, um, you're, you're, we won't, if, if it doesn't work out, don't come back. Yeah, <laughs> pretty much. So, and Don was very upfront. He said, it's, it's a six month gig. You know, we, it's, it's panic hiring for special effects for, for Black Cauldron because it's got a ton of effects. We're way behind. We need a lot of effects work. And you're one of the bodies that we're going to have. Uh, you, you, in. You've got an opposable thumb that seems to function okay. And, and <laughs> so, so um, if that's okay with you, and I said, sure, you know, six, month, six months working at Disney, I can put you've Disney Studios on my resume. You know that that right there is is you that know worth its weight in gold. It's like go to go to another studio now. Yeah, I worked at Disney. It's like oh, you know, come in, because that was one of the things I was finding going to other studios is people that had worked at Disney. Got they the didn't gig. even they didn't even need to sh- you know show portfolios or anything. As I worked at Disney, you're in. So I thought that right. would be great. So you figured this is my thought, ticket to the be great. Yeah. stars. So I I went to Disney and. Got put as uh, an assistant. I was Mark Dindle's assistant, one of several, and uh, he just did um, did uh, smoke and dust and and objects and water and just like whatever came down the pike, you know, like in betweening and and sure. Oh yeah, and yeah, yeah. Like yeah. All that stuff, and the work was miserable. Um, just because it was so tedious. And oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. just like, oh, God. That's where Pete Young started. He started as an effects yeah. engineer. Um, and the movie was not really what I would call good. And but the effects were nice. <laughs> but the effects were nice, and the crew was great, and the people were great, and I had a really good time. I mean, it was like, that was where I learned. It's like, honestly, it doesn't matter as much if the work itself isn't that good is if you're in a good environment and you know and you're you, enjoying it in the paychecks you can still be creative in other ways and there was you know they had like kind of minor you know their character shows and the the little productions that they would do and you could oh, do yeah. little side stuff musker was doing the caricature shows even then musker was doing the caricature shows and they still still had the uh, the eddie and friends show that uh, mike giamo and joe ramp and and uh the window you're at the window and on the roof and all that so I mean there was it was a fun place so I, I, I really enjoyed it and stayed in effects for a while did uh, did effects for the black cauldron didn't get laid off because then they had another um, another show a live-action show um, called my science project with Dennis Hopper and I don't know who else but um, uh, about a uh, an, an alien relic that had been found somewhere and, and opened up some space time continuum and needed a lot of like kind of yeah yeah need a lot crazy of crazy uh, effects. traditional effects yeah which at that time was all done with an optical printer and and uh, you know hand drawn and, and pre digital yep so um, we would get photostats of of Dennis Hopper going whoa and we would have to have like this like these these shapes like flowing off of him that would then be given a an opacity and a and a diffusion and a glow and you know so he looked like he had all this light shooting out of him and and, and we had to sit in these dark rooms with like ink and like fill in the pinholes so yeah <laughs> <laughs> but the checks don't bounce but the checks didn't bounce and again it was it was you know it was a good crew it was it was really tedious but and my supervisor on that was John Van Vliet I don't know if you remember oh, yeah. him but uh so yeah, John was um, John Van Vliet, Barry Cook was was on that. Oh yeah, Barry, uh, I remember Barry. Yeah. Um, so we we worked on uh, worked on that for a little while, and at the as that was kind of coming to a, a, a close, I got a call from Don Hahn again. That um, you good. Always good. I'm Always just, good. I'm I just I'm a paranoid. Yeah. SOB. Oh, you you told me you told me. Uh, I got a call from Don Hahn again saying that um, um, I was going to have a chance to uh, uh, to go into the story department, which is not something that they like opened up and said we have openings if anybody wants to apply. That, that never happened. It was just we're going to give you a chance in the story department. The reason being because John Lasseter and Joe Ramft, Joe Ramft, one of the heavy hitters in the story department 
had decided to move up north and start this. Because you know, now we're now we're in the middle. We're in the middle eighties. We're in the eighties now. And, eighty-four, uh, eighty-five, and, and all that. Like good about stuff. probably around eighty-four. Um, eighty-five. Yeah, I think so. And and uh, they went off to do this this little company that nobody had ever heard of um, up uh, up in uh, the Bay Area called Pixar and um, do Listerine commercials and that kind of stuff at the time. And Never um, to be heard of again. Nice. No, <laughs> I mean, I guess you can look them up, Google it, you know. You'll, Whatever became you'll, of you'll those You'll find people. it, yeah. Um, so there's a there's an opening for a good story. So man there's an opening. I, I mean, they they were Disney uh, was was concerned that they were losing like a really good story guy, and you know, they didn't want to let Joe go. I mean, I don't know if he was on a contract or they were just appealing to him or what. And Joe said, well, "Why don't you why don't you talk to Gary? He does funny drawings. You know, he, he'd probably be good in the story." I'd known Joe since CalArts, and you know, had been friends with him there, and you know we had drawn cartoons together, and you know just to make each other laugh, basically. You know? Sure, and, sure. Uh, so that was like the endorsement from heaven, you know. It was, it was great, and so so they said, sure, let's let's give him a try, and they put me in um, they put me in the story department for Oliver and Company. Um, okay, that's your first gig. Yeah, that was my first. That guy. was my first like official story gig. Was Oliver and Company. What um, sequences did you work on? You probably worked on a lot of them. I worked on a lot of them. Um, the one I know where most of most of it still survived was when the, the little Chihuahua. Uh, I don't even remember how it happened, but he was just like zinging around. He got electrocuted and was like zinging around like a ping pong ball. In an I alley. remember that. Yeah. That was your handiwork. Yeah, it was. <laughs> um, uh, there was some montage where they're teaching the, the little cat to steal, and uh, there was a bit with. Um, I don't remember all. Of it. <laughs> it's all a it's lavender been, blur. It's been a while, yeah. But um, so I was working kind of um, under uh, under Ted Berman at that time, and um, um, Vance Jerry. And it was Vance is the one because at that time. Oh yeah, Vance is the grand old man of Disney. Jeez, oh, yeah. Story work. I mean, and, his drawings yeah. and. Uh, and I mean, he, and he would like do watercolors. Of, you know, they were just like beautiful to look at. We go. Man, you're putting color in him, and you go. I just put color in him because I don't have any ideas, and it fools people. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> yeah, that was him, self-effacing. So, yeah. So at that time, I was using like really fine tip, like like ballpoint pens. You know, mm -hmm. it was like pilot needle point pens because you could get like really you know, tight yeah. noodly stuff. It's probably still from my architectural drawing days, and I just like doing little precise things. They were nice when you were looking at it that close, when real close. but when you're across the room, they, they did not hold up. And Vance came in one day and said, "Give me your, give me your pen." And I just gave him my pen. And he gave me this box of crayons, not like regular little crayons, but the ones for like four-year-olds that are like as big as your thumb. And it was <laughs> this box of like six of them. He goes, "This is all you can use." He saw what your problem was. He did. He saw. He the saw right away. The drawings were not reading. They're not from reading. He said, "This is all you can use now. Don't use the pen. You throw it away." It's like, oh, okay. <laughs> and so I, you know, and it. Did God, that change the flavor of your drawings? God damn! Deal, if it didn't work, I mean, yeah, you really have to think differently. I mean, you have you're thinking in much broader strokes and much simpler ideas, and you're not relying on like oh, you got to shade this in and cute little details here. It's like. It's got to really communicate in, in like large capital letters. So Vance just came in with the crayons and, and he didn't critique it at all ever. I mean, he just said, "Take the pen away. Use these. This is what you have to use." And that was all he ever said. And so, <laughs> and so that's you know. Then I started doing my boards with that, and because I had a few colors, I could put a couple colors in there, you know, to help like pop some things out or, you know, yeah. drop, drop some things back, but. Basically, it was like that was that was all I had, and and it changed your whole approach. Never got any feedback from him, but after about six months of that, I said, "Okay, I'm done with the crayons." But you not know, with but the idea of doing not with the it idea. That way. So from that point on, I always used like the big sharpies, you know, and and that's that I, to this day. If I if I do a board on paper and not like on a, a Wacom or a Cintiq. I'll use Sharpies and then just like color, color it in with like, uh, you know, just like shade it with, with pencil. But um, yeah, because it's it's not as thick as the crayon, but it's 
it's bold, it's thick, it'll read from across the room. Right. I mean, that's how I boarded. That's how that's how my boards were for Little Mermaid and for uh, um, for Aladdin and you know uh, Lion King. Everything. And else you I boarded. boarded. You boarded. All of those pups in there, a lot of them, and you were swinging back and forth uh, between story. Then you were s between because you got your director's gig, and then did you go well, back and do any story work after that, or once you're a director, we'll get to that. But. Yeah, I mean, okay, I, after after um, um, Oliver and Company, I did go into Little Mermaid, and I, I worked on Little Mermaid for a while, and um, from Little Mermaid. Did you have any particular section of the film that uh, pops out at you? That the you one, on? the one that really pops out. Uh, I mean, because I did work like all over the place on that, and there's there's things like little bits here and there that I can point to throughout. But the one big section is when the crab is in the the the, the kitchen and the chef is singing the Le Poisson. And, and gonna get you. <laughs> it was, it was yeah, and. At that time, you know, working with uh, Howard Ashman and Alan Menken, you know, they, they gave me the, the demo for the song. I, this is hilarious. I mean, I felt like I was cheating because the work was already done. You know, I was like, the song is so funny. Just do the drawings and put it up. And it was like, <laughs> and people say, oh, that's great. It's like, it's the song, man. It is so funny. So, um, yeah, I worked on that. And what came after Mermaid? Then there was there was rescuers, rescuers down, down under. under. I worked Did on you? that for a while, kind of, kind of made myself a pain in the ass on that because it was, the story was not as tight and not as clear, and you know tended to ask uncomfortable questions, and um, myself and Kirk Weiss. <laughs> Our asses kicked off of that. Really? Yeah, we did. Because you were asking too many uncomfortable we're being, questions. Well, and we, we were just—I guess we were just being difficult. You know, I mean, we weren't—we weren't doing, you know, what what they wanted. And even then, they still used our work. But yeah, we, we were kind of being pain in the ass. <laughs> so, so we got we got booted off of that, um, and put into the what we call the the daycare program, which was also the development department, where they would put people that they. Didn't, didn't know really, what to do with. Didn't know what to do with. I mean, we don't have a production for you, but we don't want to. We don't want to fire you either. You know, we, we, so you're in a holding pattern. We were. So they, they put us in there, and eventually Kirk and I got um, uh, handed this project, where um, Epcot Center Disney World had contracted a uh, a show, like a 12 minute show, right. and the four and a half minute animated pre show. And they had sent all the work for the animation pre-show up to a, um, a production company up in the Bay Area. Yeah, yeah. And it was a mess because there was nobody really with an, an animation or entertainment experience running it. I mean, and there they, was nobody up there being the leader. Probably. Well, they they weren't allowed to be the leader. They're just here's the stuff. Do it. Do it like we say. Execute it. Execute it. But it was execute from like ride designers and insurance executives. Metropolitan Life was the it was the sponsor. So it was coming off like a like a mildly interesting insurance commercial. Yeah. You know. And it, yeah. And it was just like ugh. And so. Jeffrey Katzenberg, Michael Eisner, and Frank Wells cut wind of this and put the brakes on. You know, just like stop, this stop isn't all working. work. They probably looked at all of it. Yeah, they looked at it and said, "This is this is terrible." And you know, it's going into our park and having our name on it. Uh, give it to our people. We don't know why you sent it up there in the first place. Give right. it to our people. I mean, they would sent it up because it was cheaper. It was economics. Sure, absolutely. But um, so they they dumped it on the development department and Charlie Fink, who was the uh, development exec at the time, dumped it on us. And so, in, and in, us being you, me and, and Kirk. Kirk and Tom Cito at the time, and so we reboarded it and repitched it and sold it in a week, and you know, performed it and all that stuff. And they said, "Good, okay, we got ninety days." Well, it was a little more than that at that time. One hundred and twenty days, something. And and uh, at that time, it was like four or five months, yeah, six months, and um, and so. We also determined that it wasn't just the pre-show, the four and a half minute animation, that was a problem. It's like the whole main show was kind of 
dull and uninteresting as well. And what you guys have developed was Cranium Command, right? Cranium Command, yeah. With which the, is which is now a giant officer. storage facility up in, in, in Orlando. It's it's kind of sad. It's it's all mothballed. But uh, but it was a great. It, it was, was fun. Great. It got it got really good reviews. Got good good reaction. People enjoyed it. Um, and uh, so Jerry Reese, who was um, running the main show, he he asked the Kirk and I be you know help him out with boarding it and writing it and designing it. So we went to Florida and worked in what at the time was called the fishbowl in uh, the animation facility there and designed the characters and wrote the dialogue and boarded it. I mean, boarding live action slash animation. And um, uh, so they produced that. And about that same time, when we were finishing up then, there was a, a shakeup of management in one of the Roger Rabbit shorts. And the director for that left and Rob Minkoff, who was directing the uh, the four and a half minute pre-show for Cranium Command, he stepped up the ladder to pick up Roger Rabbit, leaving a vacuum. And you stepped in the Cranium Command. Well, we didn't actually step in; we were kind of pushed in. But uh, you know, they because they you said ended up. we ended up. Yeah, Kirk, Kirk and Gary. Directing. Kirk and Gary boarded this. They they know more about it than anybody else at this time. And now we're down to ninety days that, that this thing's got to be in the in the park. So. That was our first real director. But you'd done a little. You'd done some when you had uh, been uh, with Phil, right? You uh, at least a little practice. A taste, yeah. But I mean, it was a different studio, different um, what they now call different pipeline, different you know. Different dynamics. Different, different dynamics. Different the yeah, the whole thing was different. So. Kirk and I stepped into that, and we finished it, and we went to Florida, and hooray! It was it was you know very very happy thing, and and um, came back to uh, came back to Burbank to go back into the daycare department. Um, at that time, uh, we were slotted to work on a project from by Tim Hauser called Goofy of the Apes. And, oh yeah yeah yeah, and so. Early Tarzan. Early Tarzan. So we were, you know, like two weeks or so of like drawing Tarzan or drawing Goofy, you know, you know, leopard skin swinging from vines, and and uh, one Monday morning in early December, uh, Charlie Fink came running in again and said, "You guys meet me in my office." Yes, yeah, so we went into his office and he said, "Sit down." Um, there's been, um, as we knew, Beauty and the Beast had been um, in production in London with Don Hahn as a producer. Mm -hmm. And Don had been trying to get us out there a couple of times. You know, you guys come on out to London. It'll be great. You know, you can come on out and you draw funny stuff. And I, you know, I hadn't been married that long at that time. I had like a two-year-old. And I thought, this is, that's just not going to work. You know, so <laughs> I said, no, nah, I can't do it. You know, I'm sorry, but I can't do it. So um, Charlie said there'd been a shakeup with Beauty and the Beast director, uh, Personnel and the the directors at that time had left the project because they had had a disastrous screening, um, and the re the the reason being that it was it was very non musical, kind of straight, very beautiful, but kind of yeah, dull. kind of like the uh, the French version that did have a taste of that. I never it did. saw it. It did, yeah. Um, where when when Bell would walk down the 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 corridors of the castle, the, uh, the the candle would float behind her to, lo to, to light her way, and, and, you know, the food plates would just kind of float behind her so that she wouldn't be behind, you know, would attend her every need. Um, and the beast was, like, kind of a guy, just a guy, but he had, like, a kind of a slightly ape head, and it was just, it was just not that interesting. Right. And I believe... So you're probably one of the few that have seen this earlier yeah, version. Yeah. And, I mean, it was pretty, but dull. Yeah, and yeah. and uh, did they do the whole thing? Did they have the story, the whole the whole story reel? I think they did. It? I don't think I didn't see the whole story reel. I saw uh, maybe about a good half of it. And, yeah, yeah, and that was they said, okay, you've seen enough. <laughs> so yeah, I think we're we turning have. it off. Yeah. Um. Um. So they said, uh, yeah, it's it's not working. Um, Jeffrey wants to bring in the uh, the guys that did the music for Little Mermaid because that went over so well. And they want, they want Howard and Alan to do their magic to Beauty and the Beast like they did to Little Mermaid. And can you guys be on a plane on Wednesday to New York? You might get to direct it. And Kirk and I thought we were on candid camera. I mean, it was like... 
You didn't think that they were actually assigning you as directors, but... This is some elaborate joke, yeah. And now, is this Jeffy that told you this? Or this is Charlie this? Fink that told Charlie, us this. Charlie yeah. told you that. Yeah, and <laughs> my first reaction, because the our, our first... Um, our first run at directing on the Cranium Command thing had been a little up and down, and the down parts were like really down. I mean, I had never been screamed at before by executives. I'd I'd been like looked at crossly, but like actually screamed at. It was like I don't like this. What What were their issues, or do you even remember at this? Oh, point? it was like a, a scene that that uh, one of the executives thought should go a different way. You know, we thought it should go this way, and and. Bam, you know, just like the 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 walls, yeah. So and and it was it came down to you fucking do it the way I tell you. It's like, all right, all right. So, okay. Um, so that wasn't fun, and I thought. And I you weren't looking forward to doing I was that not, again. I'm not particular. I mean, this is like a great opportunity, but at the same time, it's like this isn't what I really saw my career as being. You know, I saw myself as an artist and an animator and storyboard artist and doing leadership was not you know it, it wasn't something that I had like trained for or because I knew a lot of guys that you know they just wanted to be a director that's all they wanted they, so, right. you know, and and to just kind of fall into it like that pissed people off because like they've been working at it forever and you just sure. walked in the door um, so I, I mean, honestly my first reaction was can we say no? And Charlie said, no, you can't say no. So, <laughs> so okay, then I guess yes. So we okay, were on, okay, we'll do it. We were on a plane on Wednesday and uh, flew to New York and went, you know, it's like Midtown and uh, there's a Disney building there and we were up on like the 30th floor or something like that and then this big conference room and we sat there for better part of a week and kind of hashed out you know the new outline for the story so you basically did the story beats for the new version for the new right? version and how, how many worked. songs did uh i think they had maybe they had the first one the opening song um they i believe they had kind of the bones for be our guest but at that time it was being sung to maurice because he was the one that got caught in the castle, and he's walking around and going, "Oh my goodness, look at all this stuff!" And this, oh, and he shivers a little bit, and mm -hmm. and the candle says, "Oh, he's chilled to the bone. Let's give him some food and etc." And and so they sang "Be Our Guest" to him. We had that all the way animated before we changed it. Wow, that was our joke. Like, never got out of the Blu-ray. No, I don't think so. But I, I mean, our joke was, uh, "Note to clean up: change Maurice model to Bell model." And. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so um, and then I came back, and Kirk and Brenda uh, Chapman and Roger Eilers, they, they stayed, I think Chris Sanders as well, they stayed like another week, and they went upstate to like the, uh, what was it? It was like the Residence Inn in Fishkill, New York. And, yeah. And, you know, they worked on the songs a little bit more. And then, yeah, from there on out, we were... Uh, you know, working on... Uh, working right away. Working right away. So yeah. how long was that whole... You, you worked on it then for, what, two years, year and a half? Yeah, a closer to a year and a half. I mean, I think it, it was a really tight schedule because they had, they had had a tight schedule to begin with, and when when they threw everything out, they didn't redo the, the deadline. They just it's said... It's still the same release date. still the same date. release date. You just got to make it work. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so <laughs> what do you up. remember? What do you remember from that production about... Were you just always stressed out because you're always under the gun? Well, running the, from the beginning of meeting it. Meeting to meeting. Yeah, I mean, the beginning of it was um, Kirk and I were not really being officially recognized as directors because we were kind of trainee directors and uh, um, they called us acting directors. Oh, which, yeah, yeah, which yeah. We, we had to act like. I think like, somebody else told me. Yeah, we had to act like directors. Um, and that, that meant that. We had um, we had a writer that we didn't always agree with, and if uh, we said something that she didn't like, she didn't listen to us because we weren't real directors. We're you know, so really it was directors. kind of stressful. Um, and um, visions uh, of Alice in Wonderland dancing in her head. Oh man! <laughs> and God knows what else. But <laughs> but um, 
And yeah, and since it was so crazy, you know, just schedule wise, yeah, there was always meetings. I have to recast people, and and now now the floating candles and plates and everything were characters because you know we said right at the start, it's like you know this floating uh, floating object stuff is doesn't is nice and magical in a live action movie, but it, for Disney, come on, put you know give them character. So you know, had to design them, had to cast them, had to write for them, you know, and. and so you were probably in on all the casting then, right? Oh, absolutely. So, yeah, and a lot of the casting we had to fly back to New York for because we were using a lot of Broadway talent. It's like Jerry Orbach, you know. Was yeah. How did he come to? Uh, was Alan was and he Howard, one of the A list? Well, Alan for Alan and Howard, yeah, we had no idea who he was. Right. And we didn't we didn't know who Jerry Orbach was, and they said, oh yeah, he's like an old song and dance man from the '60s, and you know, he's he's really great. And we had listened to a few people that we that we kind of liked, and. and Jerry nailed the the kind of Maurice Chevalier vibe, and he had that you know that real rich voice. And it was, oh yeah, yeah. And we said, well, the Fantastiques. Is yeah, what we were, okay, let's go with, we'll go with him. And and um, David Ogden Styers was like, bam, he was he was a shoe in. He's a voice. voice Paige O'Hara. I mean, Be- Bell was a very important part, and there were a lot of really good Broadway actresses. And there was one girl that Kirk and I liked, and there was another girl that Howard Nolan liked. Howard now on one, you know, and, yeah. <laughs> because you know they said, look, you know, yeah, we we agree, this girl is really good, but Paige, I, we think, can give you more, you know, she's 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 more. And they had a little more juice. They had a little juice. more juice, and they, I mean, we had to recognize these guys know what they're talking about. Yeah, yeah, you know. So yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, we do like her, and we'll we'll fight for her, but they're very persistent and they're making very compelling arguments, and they know their shit. So yeah, we'll listen to them. And what's funny to me is today. Nobody would think of Jerry Orbach as anything but a cop. Right. <laughs> right. And I tell people that. It's like, yeah, is that guy there? Yeah. He's the candle. <laughs> so, what? <laughs> we did end up speeding up his voice by like 3%. Really? And yeah, just a little tiny bit. Just cause, just to make him sound just a little smaller. Because, you, you know, you've deep? heard his voice. He's got that real deep, gravelly voice. And we pitched it. We didn't pitch it. We just sped it. But But just like... Amazing how much like one percent will do, and with three percent doesn't sound like anything. Right, four percent was too much. You know, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So it starts sounding like Alvin and the Chipmunks. Yeah. At some point. So, um, and then the Beast was the hardest. I mean, we we just went everywhere because we're looking for somebody you know with you know the 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 gravity in their voice and the you know the the, the kind of gruffness and but also some kind of charm. And we listened to like hundreds of people, like in LA, in New York, and finally we were, you know, okay, we're in, we're in LA again, and Kirk and I are on rounds. We're talking to to layout and animation, and you know, just whatever else. And between meetings, and our our um, casting director comes running up to us in the hallway and says, "Guys, we just heard um, um, we just heard Robbie Benson, and." Uh, yeah, you don't think of Robbie and, Benson. And Kirk and I look at each other, and, and Kirk goes, Robbie what? Benson? Ice Castles, Robbie Benson? <laughs> and, and and our our casting guy goes, yeah. And he ran off, and we're like, That's okay. That's not going to work. Yeah, well, we said, <laughs> I guess. You know, we've tried everybody. We not, might as well try him. And we heard him, and he was like, wow. Damn, he's good, you know, because he got... He got the you know the, the the deep stuff, but he also got the he was also funny. I mean, he was like naturally like a funnier character. You didn't have to filter or do anything to his voice. There was, was stuff just... that we did like when he would like really go ballistic, that we would like mix in like animal roars and like you know yeah, yeah, pitch yeah. down the bottom and all that. But a lot of the stuff we left alone, particularly like if he had to sing, we couldn't touch him. I mean. Some some of the stuff if if you know you just like kind of boost the bottom end a little bit just to to give them a little more weight, but we weren't pitching or or uh, yeah or mixing, but but you couldn't even do that when he was singing because it would like it like screw up the uh, it would do something you know when yeah singing, yeah it's like to totally throw him off so most of the time he's he's uh, he's good a few times yeah we we mixed in like a lion and a bear and a Dodge Charger and you know whatever, whatever else. So. So, what was the, was that probably, would, would you consider that, of the features that you've done, that was probably the most hectic in terms of 
you got to get it out. You've got to get it. I think so. Yeah. Together and all yeah. This stuff. I mean, it, they all have their problems, but it was the most because we had the tightest deadline and we didn't know what we were doing that much. And when did you become the official directors? That's my question. It was like about six months in. Really? Yeah. I mean, it took a little while. And and Jeffrey called us into this conference room and, and said, "All right, guys, you're it. We've we've watched your we've watched your progress. We like what you're doing. We have confidence in you. You're real boys now." And, <laughs> yeah. So, and you know, Kirk and I left and went, hey, great. <laughs> what's that mean? It means we better get back to work. So, <laughs> so it all that meant was didn't that ultimately you... change anything other than you know they, I, I guess somewhere they some paperwork. Not really. Did the writers start paying more attention? No, to I mean the writer, not really, <laughs> and everybody else didn't give us any trouble anyway. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah. For me, the biggest problem was I got to watch what I say because. It was my habit to, you know, just like throw off, you know, like funny jokes. Hey, wouldn't it be funny if Gaston did this? And the story guy would go, okay. It's like, no, 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 don't do that. That's, I, was, I was just kidding. So Just funning with you. Just messing. Um, <laughs> and the most frustrating part was that I didn't have time to draw at all. I mean, there was almost no drawing done. I did like one little tiny section of boards in that when LeFou was waiting for... Uh, Bell to come back home, and he's like dressed as a snowman. I mean, that was my, you know, him with with his arms sticking out, holding the sticks, and you know that that was that was like the one drawing that I did for the show. Really? Yeah. That's, that's uh, interesting. Did you do any boarding for your uh, for the other features that you did, or did you? Um, mostly not. Mostly not. I mean, we did we did like little doodle sketches, and we 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 did. Um, a lot of times when we were sitting in, like with the writers or you know just other story guys, and, and just like throwing out ideas, we'd do drawings like that, but not really boring. It's funny because Ed Gombert told me that Jennifer U. Nelson does a lot she of does a lot of boring. DreamWorks is a different place, and when I when I went there, they were like at first they were very down on me that I was not boarding all the time. Also, and I said. I not really don't. I don't really have time to board all the time because I'm in these meetings like. Like frame fucking the the script, you know. Oh, we're yeah, we're yeah, like yeah. wordsmithing this, and I don't actually have time to sit and do the boards, and you know it's not. <laughs> you gotta you gotta find that balance, and and they they really expect. Well, I won't say they absolutely expect because they've they've hired di uh, directors there that don't. Come now, from an are there some account. directors that do a lot of boarding, and some directors over there that don't? There have been, and generally they found that they they like the directors that do because it's it's easier communicating for everybody. Right. You know, the, the director can say, no, "No, this is what I mean." But that's that was never the style at Disney, right? Disney, they generally. Well, I mean, I don't think Ron and John were board artists; they were animators. Right. Um, but they were artists, and they could. You know, they, they could convey graphically, thing, graphically when they The funniest watch. thing was what, me watching Wooly draw over somebody's drawing. Uh -huh. And the artist would go, I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> Wooly would, no, it's like this. And it would stick it up and it would be like, what, what, yeah, what is it? You yeah. know. Well, one of the one of the great primo animators was way out of practice. I'm not a good board artist, and I'd seen board artists like that. That you know they come from animation and they do beautiful animation. They could draw beautifully, but stringing a couple of ideas together was was more difficult. Different muscle. Yeah. So, so what happened? What happened when the, going back to the end of Beauty and the Beast? What happens? The picture comes out and is. You know, big, and uh, did anything change for you at the studio at that point? Or well, I mean, I, I didn't feel like I was going to be fired at any time if I, you know, if I if I screwed up. Um, I, I felt like they would listen to me a little bit more. Yeah, yeah. Um, which wasn't to say that I had that much more to say, but it, but at least you know, if if I was put in a in a project now. I wasn't like some some green kid junior director in training. It's like right. no, I've I've got this body of work, so I'm I'm, I'm not a complete idiot. Right. So right, right. Um, yeah, I mean, it came out. Honestly, none of us knew what we had while we were doing it, except for Brian McEntee, who said this thing is going to make a hundred million dollars, and we laughed. We honestly we laughed at him. 
because nothing had made a hundred million dollars in animation before that. Right, closest it made one hundred and forty-five. Made one hundred forty-five. Yeah, closest it had come before that was Little Mermaid, made like eighty-six, and yeah. that was like through the roof, record-breaking. You know, parades. Oh in yeah, the street. yeah, yeah. Because before that, I mean, if you if you broke fifty, you were doing good. Thirty, well, thirty-five. Fox the Hound better. did fifty-two. Yeah, and the rest, the first rescuers did like forty-six. Yeah, and. I remember Card Walker grabbing Wooly in the hallway and saying, I'll build a whole new building. This is, you know what this is doing in Europe? And he was going on and right. on, and Wooly sitting there with a cigar going, eh. And so you, you, you basically did triple that. Yeah, so. well, and Brian saw it coming, and we were like, come on. You know, we were just trying to get the thing done on time, and Brian was like, no, you guys you guys got something good here. And so when it, when it broke $100 million, Don and Kirk and I ran out and got champagne and charged over to Michael Eisner's office. And, you know, we're going to, like, just crash in. Where, whoever's in there, we don't care. Pour it over his head. Yeah, we're coming in with the, uh, we're going to do the, the Gatorade dump on, on Michael <laughs> Eisner. And his secretary said, no, stop. We're like, did you $100 million? Said, no. So she, she just had us, like, wait. I'm like, what the hell, man? Why? This is important. You know, and, like, 10 minutes later, like, these three, like, really big guys in these really expensive suits come out. Thank you very much. Okay, pleasure talking to you. And off they go. All right, what do we got? You know, and <laughs> these guys evidently were from the Vatican. So, <laughs> oh, oh, just that. So, so he didn't want to be interrupted with uh, with with the, the cartoon with the, the cartoon boys and 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 their 